Hey everybody, hope you're doing well out there. This is episode number two of Launch Sports Cards. And I'm going to get right into it today. A lot to talk about on this topic. And that is the different methods to build a sports card collection. So basically, the ways you can buy, where to buy, the pros and cons of each method, who each method caters to, and the strategy and some tips for the best results in each. So the first thing you need to do before buying anything in any market, but definitely a sports card market, is determine why you want to buy. Why are you doing this? Do you want to make money? Is it something you have fun with? Are your children into it so you want to bomb with them? That's a personal decision because that's going to determine where you should head. All right. Once you determine what you're even doing here, decide your goal you want to reach in the sports cards. So again, if you say, hey, I want to make money, decide. Do you want to become a dealer? Do you want to become, you know, just somebody with a side business and a side hustle, extra income? You know, do you want to do this full time, part time? What's your goal in there? Are you a collector? Great. Are you a collector that wants to build a registry set and have the greatest collection of all time of a specific player? Or you just pick up random things here and there. Whatever it is, set your goal. Then from there, you need to understand where you are today and then what strategy is best for you to reach those goals. So self-awareness is important. So if you are struggling right now financially, you know, paycheck to paycheck, or you don't have a job, be truthful with yourself, accept where you are, and get a goal and figure out what do I need to do to get to that goal. So if you're sitting there with very little money and you're only focusing on, you know, $10,000 items and, you know, posting pictures of things on Instagram and making it look like you're a baller, that's not going to help you. All right. On the same token, if you are established in your life and you've conquered a lot of different business ventures and you've made a lot of money and you've done well and now you want to get into this for financial reasons, you know, or even just something new to conquer. Don't come in here thinking you have conquered the business world. So this is going to be so easy because it's all kids. Be truthful with yourself. Yes, you've done well in your life, but you don't know anything about this. So just be smart, be truthful, accept where you're at, figure out where you want to get to. And make a plan to get you there. Step number one. To help you kind of determine some of those things I just mentioned. I broke these down from what I've seen into the really the groups that make up the majority of the sports card market today. Obviously there's subgroups of this and versions and different things. But this is generally what I've seen Who's involved in this? So you got number one, your collector. This is the person who buys because they love it. It's passionate. It's a hobby. They're not looking necessarily to sell items. Some collectors do sell items in order to buy other things. But the general goal is not to make an income. It is something that they do because they enjoy it. You have high-end collectors. You know, the people who are buying, you know, at Heritage Auction, a $300,000, you know, Babe Ruth autograph. You have that. Then you have, you know, pretty much everybody else who does what they can and they pick what they enjoy. Number two, investors. So what are investors in general? That's the person who is brought an opportunity or finds an opportunity to make money, they sit down, they do the homework, they calculate the risk, 
They calculate the potential reward, and then they make a decision whether to put their money into it, and away you go. So there's a billion different things that you can invest in, stocks, real estate, you know, you name it. There's all different strategies of investing. So you got long term. So you're not worried about making, you know, a ton of money tomorrow, but you want very consistent growth over time so that in 40 years from now, the money you're putting in, you know, you'll have something to retire off of. You know, that's the main idea with that. The short term investors who are a little more aggressive, they're a little more risk tolerant. So they'll put money in today, but they want to make it back quick. They want their money liquid. They want to move and shake. All right. Some people have a little bit of both in them. Some people only do one or the other. With investors in this, something that you'll hear or see, the word flippers, like what is a flipper? It's not a dolphin. It is basically a type of investor, but because of the age bracket, which are young, you know, teenagers, tw young 20-year-olds, they call them flippers, which is basically a short-term investor. They're buying a product at one price, they're selling it as quickly as possible at a higher price, and then they're looking for the next thing. So that is one of the things that has really driven this market, in my opinion, you know, the young generation of those kids, like you hear what the Gary V say about the sneaker flippers who are now moving into this. So that group of people a lot of money comes in through them. So if that's what you want to do, determine whether you're long-term, short-term, which is um, obviously dependent on where you're at and you know your financial situation and your goals. Number three are the dealers. These are the people who have businesses in this. Some of them have stores. Some of them don't. They go to the card shows. They are active in the market in a lot of different areas. They have connections. Some of them have, you know, distributors that drop off products. So they're a place to go buy. They're a wealth of knowledge. They're not a million dealers out there. It's hard to be a dealer in anything. But that's who those are. And in the dealer arena, you have some big time players and you have your small local you know mom and pop shop that's been there for 40 years so the big dealers the blowout cards and the steel city collectibles and dave and adams they set the market they're what's known as market makers so they're the big time so again you want to be familiar with all of these different areas but you have to decide which one you are and which one you want to be. Where are we getting product from? Where are we getting cards from to sell or collect or to do anything with? So there's a bunch of different methods. Some you're probably very familiar with. Some you might never have heard of. But I'm going to go through them all now. Tell you what they are. The pros and cons of doing business in each of those arenas. Some tips on them and, you know, where do you go to do that type of business? Because we all need product. So whatever you're doing in this business, unless you're just watching, uh, you know, clips on YouTube and uh, Facebook and you're not buying anything, you're going to need a place and a strategy to buy. So buying method number one is old traditional. Everybody who's ever been in sports cards at any point in their life is familiar with this and that is buying packs opening the packs going through them hoping for the best so whether you did it as a kid you do it now everybody at one point or another who's involved has done that know what it is i don't need to explain that why i'm bringing it up is because nowadays there's a lot into that and one of the big mistakes people make early in sports cards is they spend a lot of money in this phase thinking one thing and then they find out after the damage is done that they were wrong. 
So here's the pros to that. You can hit a monster card. You can pull a game changer in your life. That is out there. They are in packs. Every big expensive card started in a pack somewhere. So that is the allure to it. That is a big pro of it is without spending a hundred grand, you could get a hundred thousand dollar item potentially. The condition of the cards out of the packs is generally one of the positives of opening them yourself and direct sealed boxes and cases and things. Reason being, number one, there's no guarantee that the card comes out of the pack perfect, but odds are better of that than when you buy through second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth parties and 20 people have handled the card. There's more of a chance of that where either A, somebody drops it, somebody nicks the corner trying to get it in, packaging, shipping gets banged around where the card gets a little bit beat up. Or all those people, at least some of them, bought the card with the intention of grading it and profiting off of it, and they looked at it, and they decided, hey, there's a defect there. And then you end up buying that not knowing any better because you're just looking at the price, and then all of a sudden you're stuck with a dud if that is your intention. So the condition you have a lot more control over, you're the first person seeing that card, in the live market. With buying boxes and packs and cases and all this stuff, it is a lot of inventory early for you to go through and to, for you to have access to. So that can be a positive for you. It can be a negative also, which I'll mention. But the positive is you have a lot of stuff early that you have the ability to sell. So the hope is you buy a case, you pull some really high-end good stuff, you get your money kind of there, and then you're left over with a bunch of product that you can kind of practice with, whether that be listing something on eBay for the first time and you're nervous and it's a $2 card or a $0.99 cents card, and then practice shipping it and just kind of going through the process. It's a good just starter kind of kit for a lot of people when you do buy a bunch of sealed stuff and open it because guess what with every expensive Xeon card there comes you know 500 veteran base cards and things that are just not worth it to most people one of the things I like most about opening stuff yourself is you really learn about the product better than in my opinion a lot of the other methods reason being when you're opening a box, you don't know what's in there. And a lot of the time, it's a new product for most people. So they're not familiar with it in general. So as you're going through it, you're seeing things, what do you do? You pull a card out, it looks different than the other ones. You run over, oh, maybe this is expensive. You look it up, it's 49 cents. But you got some knowledge there of, okay, those type of cards. So you learn... The difference in pricing from inserts and base cards and what products have, uh, you know, different values attached to things. Like one of the first things I noticed when I got into this was back when I was collecting as a kid, inserts were expensive. Like that's what you wanted. Now inserts are like fluff in packs and the base cards and obviously I don't want to call them inserts but the numbered cards and autographs and all that stuff, like the special cards, that's what drives the value and the base cards are next. Where inserts are junk. You know, you open a Panini Prism box, you'd much rather a base Zeon Williamson than an emergent Zeon Williamson. So you learn the ins and outs, the difference between, you know, refractors and prisms and what they look like from doing that because you're invested you bought a box you spent your money you're going to look it up beckett and cardboard connections and that stuff have a lot of really good articles when stuff comes out that breaks down the boxes and what's in them and what to look for 
And that's a good starting point. It's not going to tell you what's valuable or not, but you kind of figure that out for yourself from looking, you know, once the products start to sell out there. But that is a huge benefit and one I like. The most important thing really to opening stuff yourself is it's the most enjoyable. So you got to count that as a pro. You're going to have the most fun with it. You could bond with your children, you know, you could give yourself something to do on a lonely Friday night. That is important and can't be discounted. With that comes the cons. So here is really what you need to pay attention to because something I think everybody who gets back into this learns at some point. It's just how much money is going to cost you to learn this lesson. So number one, like I mentioned, you have the big, big, big chance of getting, uh, I mean, the big reward and the chance of getting that really expensive item. With that comes an enormous risk that you're not getting anything. And with the prices of boxes nowadays, the money you're spending to have the chance at that and the likelihood that that box is going to equal and at least match value, it's not really in your favor. So unless you pull a big card, you're kind of lost. So you want to avoid that if you're doing it as a, a business and trying to worry about income because, again, your odds are not great of getting your money back that you initially invested, and no financial advisor would advise that for a customer. So with that, like I said, the boxes, in the, it's very expensive nowadays. Long gone are the days where a pack is a, you know, a quarter or 99 cents. Individual packs, boxes, cases, I mean, you, if you ever want to look, go look at one of the big distributors online like a blowout cards and look at the prices of these boxes i mean 200 300 500 700 800 those almost seem reasonable right now so when i say a hobby box of prism is 900 dollars for 12 packs you know and whatever uh you know 30 cards in there that's crazy to a lot of people but that's realistic because there's boxes that are ten thousand dollars you know, National Treasures Basketball, the three-box case, which is coming out at some point in April. I don't know if they delayed it or not. You know, you're talking close to $15,000 for three boxes. So the cost can really add up very quick on you, especially if you get to the point where the fun is taking over for you and, you know, you're getting the thrill of the chase a little bit too much from there like i mentioned as one of the pros is you will start off with a lot of inventory that could also lead to a negative thing where if you're buying seven thousand boxes it's a lot of extra cards a lot of junk takes up space in your house real fast it's not worth anything it's not worth your time so the best thing to do with that stuff is donate it but in general it's just waste. So you want to avoid that. And that's one of the things that buying boxes and a lot of them comes with as a negative. One of the biggest things that you'll see, and maybe you don't think of it this way, but buying boxes and cases and that stuff, it is a form of gambling. And it's addicting. You could get addicted to opening sports packs. It sounds stupid. But it happens. So just like somebody gets addicted to gambling and they spend a lot of money and money they don't have and they're doing reckless stuff and they can't stop, the same thing with boxes and cases because honestly, it's the same mechanism. It's that dopamine that's released by, hey, I can win here. And whatever that feeling is inside of us when you're doing something like gambling or drugs or drinking – and that feel-good feeling and that hope, it gets triggered in this as well. So you've got to really watch that. And again, if you have an addictive personality in general, you really want to think twice about that strategy. So let's say you heed the warning, you like some of the positives. Where are we buying boxes and stuff? 
So a bunch of places. Number one, your local card shop, if you have one. It's always a good idea to form relationships with people that you can meet face to face. Sometimes you'll get better deals. Sometimes you'll get access to things that maybe, you know, will sell out in the bigger markets. And that guy is a, you know, been in business for 30 years and he has a distributing license with tops and he'll get one case of something that's hard to get. And you're his buddy now because you spent a lot of money. He appreciates that and he'll call you and get it to you. So that's a good thing. I recommend that. Just remember with local stuff and small stuff, like price check, because they have bills, they have inventory. It doesn't mean they have the best price. Also, in person, you definitely are paying taxes in most cases. So that all adds up. Number two, you got the online distributors, the big boys. You know, like I said, Blowout, Steel City. They're the market makers. They set the pricing pretty much. So a good idea if you are buying boxes is check with them and what they're selling for and if things that they have sold out. You know, it's just a good market indicator for everybody. And they're also very good prices on a lot of stuff. Another thing is direct from, you know, Pinini's website. That's very hard to do in terms of getting stuff. They started with Dutch auctions nowadays, which, you know, again, at some point I'll explain all these things, but look up a Dutch auction if you've never done one. But most of the time it's they'll put a product on sale. They'll put an order limit on it. Okay, you can buy two boxes per transaction and it sells out very fast if it's a hot product. The price is generally the most favorable you're going to find because the secondary market hasn't taken over and people buy those because either A, they want to open them or B, they want to flip them and make money. So it's very popular. A lot of competition. People use bots, robots to you know buy up all the inventory before you physically can do it. Things that you need to be aware of. So you can't count on that, but if you can get an order through, that's your really best bet of getting it cheap. The other good bet is the retail market. Walmart, Target, they carry cards. I know in different states, different places, like Walgreens has certain types of cards sometimes. And I think um, a grocery store, Myers, you know, I don't know where that is. It's not around me, but they sell cards. They have retail products and they have good retail products. You know, Panini Prism was in Walmart. It's Dunruss Optic Basketball, all the Tops products pretty much. You could get that stuff off the shelf. The good thing about that is the price is already set. Like a blaster box of Panini Prism Basketball is $19.99. It didn't matter that it was selling for $100 on the internet. It was $19.99. Problem with all that is finding the hot products that people want because – you know, you have vultures there and people who are, make deals with the reps and distributors who drop them off there. So a lot of competition in that. The other thing is a lot of retail products aren't as good as, you know, hobby stuff and some of the different things. And there's also a lot of junk products that look cool and interesting. And if you don't know better, you're buying things that basically are just worthless. Obviously, you have eBay and Facebook and Instagram to buy boxes to. That's where the flippers head to to sell these things. So you got a lot of avenues to go down. Who is this for? Collectors. You know, you like cards. You enjoy them. You have your money set aside for your cards. You buy a box. You open it. You hope for the best. But you're not worried about turning a profit. Also, people who want to have a good time that have money, but also have self-control. Because with any good time, can lead to problems. And if you have no money, you shouldn't be buying boxes. So if you're that person and, hey, you want to have a good time, you got the money, and you know you can buy one box and be done, that's a good thing. If you find yourself buying 15 boxes and then going back and buying 12 more and doing this and then buying something else because you didn't hit anything in that. So let me try that. And all of a sudden your bank account is dwindling. Avoid this. So with that kind of went over some of them, but the basic tips here are know what products in years are traditionally strong. 
Now, you don't want to be spending money on boxes, which are a chance to begin with, and then buying a box that really has no upside for you anyway, even if you hit the best card in the whole damn set. So learn that before you put the money in. Figure out all the different ways the product is packaged and what's possible and what's guaranteed in each box. So you'll see in a lot of boxes, guaranteed one auto in this, guaranteed two autos in this box. Per case, you get this or that. Figure out what's in each one because they're not all equal and figure out the price points and then figure out what's really worth your, your money. What's your best odds in terms of actually getting something? And with that budget, you know, figure out, hey, even if you're you know, doing this just for fun, set a budget. You, know, you don't want to tempt fate and end up spending a ton of money that you don't have. Shop it around. So after you set your budget, you know what you want, shop the prices around. You know, don't just buy off, you know, the online. Now, there's some products that sell out fast, so you don't really have time to do that. But get an idea before they even come out of what the market might bear. And buy the hot stuff when it's available. But everything else, you got plenty of time to shop around because it's most of it's an unlimited product production. So you don't have to worry about, you know, missing out on most things. But some of the things you do. So you'll figure that out by learning the products. The biggest thing and the best thing to do with this, if this is of interest to you on like a real business level, is buy the boxes sealed, keep the boxes sealed, and then sell the boxes. That is a big business. That is something you make a lot of money doing. The problem with that business-wise is your inventory flow and how much stuff you can actually get is always going to be random. So, yeah, if you can find 50 blaster boxes of Dunruss Optic at, you know, your local Walmart, you're going to make a lot of money. But that might be the only 50 boxes you ever find. So you can't really rely on that. So don't make that your business model of hunting down hot stuff. It is good to incorporate, though, because once you learn the products and you know where they're at and you kind of, you know, make connections with people, there's very, very good profit in that. And last tip, whenever buying any of this type of stuff, Make sure you're buying sealed product and check if the stuff has been tampered with. So if you're buying packs, something that does happen is people open the packs, they look through the cards, pull out whatever's good, replace that with something not as good, and then they'll reseal the pack and resell it. Check that, you know, be a detective. Avoid buying things from unreputable places helps with that a lot like i would never buy a pack off of ebay a single pack so with that boxes make sure the boxes you're buying are sealed so every box that comes for the most part has the company seal around it all right and like pinini will have a white seal and have pinini written on it make sure it's sealed if it's not sealed same thing can happen somebody could open up some of the stuff hit something, and then put in another pack, close it back up. Also, that could be resealed. So if it's supposed to say Panini on the seal and it doesn't, you have an issue. So check all of those things to avoid yourself a huge waste of money. But it does happen a lot, so watch out for it. Cases are the best thing to buy if you can afford them. So a sealed case from somewhere. Why is that? The cases will come 12 boxes to a case, and every case generally has specific things that you could expect in them. So just like every box will have like one autograph per box, every case has a certain amount of kind of things that the buyer can expect. So when you buy the whole case sealed yourself, that's your best shot of doing well because, again, the boxes sold individually – might have already been hit all right so what that means is that box they open them now they're selling the 12 boxes by themselves one of them opens and a huge cards in there now the other 11 boxes are sitting there most people aren't telling anybody that and now you buy them and you're already out of luck but you don't know that so buy the sealed case if you can if you're buying boxes check what they should look like 
make sure that they do and packs same thing but never buy a pack or really anything from somebody that you can't trust to begin with so buying method number two breaks all right what is a break basically in layman's terms paying for someone else to open sealed product and then you get the cards based off the terms of the break all right so normal breaks you go in to the break group they say okay we're breaking a box of national treasures football then they'll have kind of a system so one of the systems that they do is they'll apply a value to each team and then all the players in the box that are pulled from that team you get so obviously some teams depending on the players in that specific product and the rookies will be more expensive than others so you could decide to do that another thing that is common is where they'll just number it and then everybody play pays the same price they pull a number and whatever team is matched to that number that person gets that team so that's more obviously random but that's how it works and it's very very popular something that really uh i think helps the market a lot in general but it might not be the best thing for you to do so what are the pros of that same thing you could hit a monster card in there very it's possible one of the things i like about breaks is a lot of them have give you the the option if you do pull a big card to submit it directly for you so they're connected to you know group submitters and people because you know they've been in the business longer and instead of you handling it and figuring out what to do with it they'll tell you hey submit that to psa or or beckett and they take care of it for you that's a big benefit if especially if you're very new and maybe don't know what to do if you get a big card with that, you're also getting some free advice. You know, the guy sitting there has been doing this. He knows the cards. He's going to look at the card. You know, he'll see if there's a defect or something where it's not worth it way before you do. So that is obviously beneficial. It's a cheap entry point. You might not have $14,000 to buy some boxes of National Treasures, but you can spare two fifty dollars to get into a break and maybe you get lucky. So it's much cheaper then obviously buying the boxes yourself. You are narrowing down your focus in breaks. Sometimes, you know, to specific teams, players, brands. Like when you're buying boxes of stuff, obviously you know the brand, but what players are in there and what teams, who knows? So that's a good thing. Also, you meet people. It's a very social thing. I watch breaks on Facebook all the time. I'm not buying into them. But I watch them. They're fun. People are talking. There's a chat going on. And it does give you an opportunity to meet other people in the hobby, which, you know, you can't call a, a negative. Cons of this, you know, your odds aren't good. So when you're buying the box, you know, your odds are one thing. Now that guy's buying the box. He's breaking it, but you're lowering your odds to get a good card because now you're only getting specific cards out of there of a team. So... It just really decreases your odds. That's why it's obviously cheaper than just buying the box yourself and doing it. But you got to remember that you're not likely to really get something that's amazing. Can happen though. Sometimes though with the breaks, part of the fun and why you do it is, you know, the live breaks and the action. So you can watch it taped, uh, you know, when they replay it. But, you know, if they have the break at seven o'clock, and you signed up yesterday, and you're excited about it, and you're looking forward to it, and all of a sudden, your wife says, oh, we got to go do this, and you got to miss it. You know, it's like, for me, the same thing of, like, missing a big game when your team's playing. So just something that's, you know, kind of silly, but it does play into it because part of the fun and of the break is the action. It's also very addicting. Again, hope, not a high entry cost. Go to any 7-Eleven or deli in America. At some point, somebody will walk in there who probably is homeless or close to being homeless, and you'll see them buying scratch-off tickets. It's the same concept. There's a hope and a dream. They could scratch together 10 bucks, 2 bucks, 20 bucks, and that's what they do. And they do it every day, and they never learn. So you got to watch that. 
Where do you do these things? Local card shops have them live. Um, big dealers' websites, you'll see them. I've seen them on eBay. I'm not really sure how that works necessarily, but you probably buy in and they send you a link or something. But the best thing is the private online groups that are dedicated to breaking, and that's where you want to kind of stay with this, um, with the breaks and that type of stuff. So the basic tips for, you know, if you are going to play around in breaks is know what you're interested in, you know, focus on spending the money on the Atlanta Braves if that's what cards you want. Find a reputable break group, just like anything else. There's good guys, there's bad guys. So you want to do your research before you just plop down money in these things because sometimes, you know, things go wrong and you don't want to be part of that. Make sure with that, even if you find a group that's well-known and established and they never robbed anybody straight up, make sure their pricing is on par. So if they have a box that costs $1,000 and their spots add up to $2,000, you don't want to be involved in that because you don't want to be paying higher costs for something that's the idea is because it's cheap and you got a chance just because you know people aren't paying attention. So look at the price of the break. Compare it to what a box would go for. If it's a little bit more, you know, that's pretty standard and common. The guy's got to make some money. But a lot of them are getting discount rates and they're, you know, dealers in reality. And they're paying $800 for the $1,000 box you would have to buy. So they already have their money. And what work are they doing besides putting out a video and opening packs? So just check that. Have self-control. I mean, that goes without saying. And that's one of the things that you know, can be applied to a lot of this, but self-control. If you're joining a break every seven minutes and you got scheduled 14 breaks on, you know, 14 different browsers tonight, not, not really ideal for your life. So the next thing is number three, which is my least favorite of all this stuff, is razzes or lines. So a razz or a line, what is it? It's basically buying into a lottery to win a specific item. So you'll see item, John Morant, uh, you know, Silver Prism, 10 spots at $80 or 100 spots at $8. And then you'll see all the numbers, 1 to 100. And then you'll see people in the comment section saying, I'll take numbers 2, 7, and 8. So that person who took two, seven, and eight, they owe 24 bucks. They pay. Once every spot is filled by random people, they draw the numbers, which every group that does this has a independent runner, they call it, and he runs a computer program, and then the numbers are pulled in whatever fashion they decide to do it, and the winning number gets the card. Sounds great, but it's the lottery, all right? You can win, obviously, big items, but you also, the pro of this, which I will tell you, is you could specifically put yourself into a lottery of the items that you're interested in. So that's a little bit better than breaking. And you have more control because the break, you get the team, you know, the players. But with this, you know the item. So if you win, that's it. So you can narrow that down. It's very low cost in terms of what you would have to pay to acquire the actual item being razzed in any case. So even a hundred dollar item, you know, and you pay 10 bucks, you know, it's a 10th of the price with those. A lot of the times you'll see a buyback option. So the item will be a thousand dollars with all the lines filled and the buyback will be 85% of that immediate. That's a pro. If you win immediate profit, can't go wrong there. The cons with this are going to be very simple. Number one, it's a gray area of legality. It is gambling. Gambling is illegal in a lot of places. You're crossing state lines gambling because all these people are from different states. This is a lot that could go wrong. And if you Google yourself razzes and arrest, there have been a lot of people who got taken down by the government for running these operations. So not necessarily sports cards, but same concept. Like win a thousand dollars, a hundred spots at ten bucks. So you put in ten bucks, 
You could win a thousand. That's the lotto. They already got that. That's where gambling is illegal in most places. They don't want people running their own lottos. So you got to kind of be wary of that. It is extremely addicting, like I mentioned. A lot of those first couple things are. But where are you going to find lines and razes in sports cards? Only online in private groups. They're not going to be out in the open. You don't want to be out in the open doing them either if you are participating in them. So keep that in mind. Go search Facebook. Join a card group. You'll see lines. The other place that you could partake in this type of activity, go to the casino because that is pretty much the same thing as lines or razes in sports cards. Who is this for? Gamblers. If you enjoy gambling, sign you up. So if you skipped a few steps about evaluating yourself and setting goals earlier, this is for you because if this is your plan of I'm going to get involved in lines and then I'm going to win a big item and then I'm going to sell it and make a lot of money and that's going to be my starting point, it's just not a great idea. But if you do believe that, lines are for you. So what my basic tips are on this is – you know, make sure the seller's legit, just like anything else. Because with most of the lines, you know, you have to pay friends and family, which is no recourse for your money. So it might only be 10 bucks. But once all that money's sent, and that guy disappears, you're all out of luck. All right. Check the pricing. So again, same thing as the brakes. If the card's worth the $200 and he has the lines up, you know, 40 lines at 20 bucks, you don't want to be involved. If you are going to be involved, use the buybacks, as I mentioned, immediate profit. Can't go wrong there. But the main tip and the only thing you really should do is avoid them. Again, as a seller, you're running a risk. As the buyer, you're running risk of a lot of things. But more importantly, it's the same thing as going to buy a scratch off ticket. With all that stuff, that's kind of the fun and the games and things that are more for, you know, the people not concerned with making this a business. So now we're going to get into the more of the business kind of strategy here and methods. So that's it for part one of buying strategies and methods in the sports card market. Part two is up right now and that goes into buying cards ungraded or raw cards and graded cards which is really one of the biggest things in the sports card market so i want to separate the fun stuff the gambling stuff from the stuff that really is for people who are interested in turning this into a business at some point or really you know collectors that uh, have a great amount of knowledge in this market. So I hope you enjoyed this. Click on that next video, and I will talk to you guys very soon.